And finally, without further ado, uh, we are ready for today's keynote interview. I'm super excited to be speaking with Yashu, head of data science at LinkedIn. Uh, let's get Ya up and jump right into the interview. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I am super excited to have this opportunity to chat with you. Um, yeah, thank you for joining us and for LinkedIn. LinkedIn has been a huge supporter of the podcast over the years, and uh, we're very appreciative of that. Thank you for inviting me. And I know Tremo for many years as well. I know that a lot of folks from my team actually has been showing up on your podcast. So it's a great honor to, to join you here today. Awesome, awesome. So let's jump right in. Uh, I, I think this interest, this interview is going to be particularly interesting because earlier in your career, you were on the platform and infrastructure side of things, the topic that we're focused on here. But now you're the head of a large data science team. Tell us a little bit about your background and your journey. Sure, maybe I'll go a little further back uh, in my journey. <laughs> and <laughs> I started out with, uh, you know, I. Um, uh, many years ago that I, I got my uh, PhD in statistics um, from Stanford. So I, in, during my time there, uh, I certainly, for those of you who may be familiar with the statistics PhD program, uh, it's, it's quite theoretical in general, um, but uh, we, we also, Stanford also has a very strong track in the applied uh, approach onto statistical problems too. So um, that's where I essentially spent a lot of my research in uh, uh, I, I sort of the how do we apply uh, you know statistical modeling to solve some of the real world problems um, and did my thesis in semi supervised learning on graphs um, back then semi supervised learning wasn't that popular <laughs> relative <laughs> to today um, and and the the reason I'm sharing that is also because you know if I'm thinking about my uh, passion and what I like to do in my um, uh, career is always about even though that I was doing platform in my earlier in my career like it's always this uh, in, internal drive of wanting to solve some real problems um, and so that fast forward to my uh, time I, I, in, I went into industry and from my PhD days um, worked at Microsoft for a few years and then joined LinkedIn and I've been at LinkedIn for about uh, eight years now kind of crazy how long, how fast the time <laughs> flies. And um, so in my, um, in my early days, both when I was at Microsoft and at LinkedIn, I was a, an individual contributor, uh, really much, very much focusing on building um, platforms and enable tooling and to solve, um, and to enable many other folks in the company to be able to utilize um, and either that would be uh, and, and you know directly applying it in the business and the products that they're in like to to kind of creating that that leverage across the board so so then I, I and, and that's what I spent most of my I want to say like most of my career on so far and about three uh, four years ago that was when I decided that I, I wanted to uh, learn how to manage a team, and I was very fortunate uh, to be supported in that a career journey and transformation by my boss, uh, who is the chief data officer at LinkedIn, and also obviously many many other leadership at LinkedIn. So, so um, yeah, so then I I stepped into more on um, I guess the what you call application side of the world of, uh, but certainly still very much working very closely with the folks who are building the platforms um, and maybe a little bit more at the customer side, but also at the same time, I do have folks on my team who are working hand in hand with the platform teams and, and from the science angle to make sure that we have the right methodology, we have the right approach on, on how our platforms are enabling and solving um, you know, the, the problems that we see. Awesome, awesome. Speaking of those problems, uh, I suspect everyone who is watching us is familiar with LinkedIn uh, and perhaps even some of the ways that LinkedIn uses machine learning, especially if they've caught some of our previous interviews with LinkedIn folks. Uh, but what are the specific types of problems that 
your teams are focused on? So uh, for those of you who are, I'm, I'm glad that a lot of you are familiar with LinkedIn, uh, but maybe not everyone is familiar with uh, how LinkedIn is organized. So um, my, my team is the global central data science team. So uh, what that means is, uh, uh, you know, there there is really only one data science team at LinkedIn. Like, and and uh, but but the way that we operate is that we actually work very closely with various different f functions and areas across the company, right? So, uh, and, uh, you know, if you think about a company has various functions that's either um, uh, you know deliver and develop product that um, the, the folks can think about. And like, you know, if you use LinkedIn's app or if you go to LinkedIn.com on the web, that's what our product is, right? So so I have folks uh, in the team who is working um, embedded uh, with various different areas of our product, either that is feed, that is messaging, that is search, that is jobs um, and, and careers, you know, all these aspects uh, of, of our product. I also have folks who are very closely working with our go-to market teams. And this is particularly uh, our marketing teams, our sales team, thinking about how uh, we can use um, um, machine learning statistics to actually optimize our go-to market motion as well. A simple example would be uh, as marketing team, like who should they target? Who, how should they optimally spend their marketing money, right? As our sales team, um, which are the customers that our sales team should really talk to? Um, and, and, and like which customers are more likely to churn so that they can actually engage with them more closely, right? So there's a lot of uh, uh, things that we do. And, and then on top of it, we, we also work on uh, no, with infrastructure teams too, right? Thinking about if you have a lot of Hadoop jobs, how do you optimally schedule those jobs such that you can you can avoid the the peak time and you can optimally utilizing your offline uh, resources, uh, both in terms of memory and storage, right? So so there is just um, a, a array of problems that the team solves. Um, and and then go, going to what I mentioned earlier is this: uh, uh, I also have folks who are focusing on more. Uh, more horizontally, um, again, thinking about enabling, right? So uh, folks who are focusing on developing experimentation um, methodology, folks who are focusing on uh, differential privacy that we can chat more later as well, like folks who are more focusing on anomaly detection algorithms, forecasting, like, you know, things that is more horizontally enabling um, various different applications. Uh, that is happening um, again in the various different uh, areas that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that your team is centralized, but uh, also embedded. Uh, you know, this is a, a the organization is a topic that's come up quite a bit uh, at the conference, and uh, every organization kind of finds a different place uh, on the spectrum, but often I see that at a certain level of size or scale of a data science team, it tends more towards a distributed model because you know the different businesses want to have their own data science resources. Uh, tell us about the, the, the choice to maintain the centralized embedded model and you know what works there, what uh, doesn't work and, and how you think about that generally. Uh, that's a great question, and you're you're spot on. Uh, and, and you know, you know, if you only have five data scientists, that and it's certainly uh, it, the 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 right decision is to centralize them because you you actually are able to offer them a career growth. You offer them a peer group that they can talk with, and all of that. And uh, you know, the when when the team gets really really big, uh, I know that there are certain companies out there that has like maybe I don't know like close to a thousand data scientists across the company, I, I think it, then you definitely get into the situation where uh, you have enough uh, mass within each of the business unit that you can have maybe not a global centralized data science team, but you kind of have the local uh, sort of center of excellence within different units. Um, so at LinkedIn, we, uh, we, we have, we have, we're somewhere in between, right? In the sense that we, my team is about 300, 350 people. Uh, so, uh, so sizable, um, uh, uh, but but also at the same time, um, this goes into you know my experience on on both the platform side and also the application side. Is if you think about the the benefit 
of having a team that is in the central organization. The benefit is the leverage, right? It's mm -hmm. that you you can you can put like for example, I can put my way behind what are the right tooling that we should be building for all data scientists, and. So where my team is sitting, we have a because we have a broad view across all different applications, we understand together, collectively, what are the needs that we have from both the uh, the algorithm standpoint, methodology standpoint, from, from the platform tooling standpoint, to be able to make every data scientist to be more successful, right? So you kind of have to like it, it, like establish, you have a, you know, this this allows us to establish uh, that it, it, that leverage across, but you can say on the other hand, the 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 downside of having a central team is the uh, potential danger of you have this central team uh, think that they are the center of excellence, sit in the corner, <laughs> not really actually try <laughs> to figure out what are the problems that's worth solving, right? Like, think about this, right? I can come up with the best algorithm, the best approach, but you know, I'm solving, I could be solving the wrong problem. Then what's the use of that in a company, right? Like if you are solving the wrong problem. Um, so so I think, uh, I actually think the LinkedIn model works really well uh, in the way that um, my, uh, uh, I, have, I, have, I have my team organized in the way that they are, they are kind of like, um, in their unit, and then they work very much embedded uh, with each of the product area or the business area they're working at, right? So, so they pretty much you can think about them as in one foot in the uh, domain area they're working at, and one foot with the rest of the data science teams. So, so they are solving problems that is really business critical, but also at the same time they get enjoying the benefit of that knowledge sharing, that leverage, uh, and, and like sort of that, that strategic um, approach in how we are solving all these applications and problems as well. Mm -hmm. Having been on both sides of the, the fence relative to platforms and infrastructure and application side of things, what do you think makes for a successful working model between uh, those two different teams where where do you draw the line between one and two it sounds like you have uh some horizontal capability within your team and how do you generally think of that aspect of uh, organizing your team's work that's that's a, such a great question um so first of all i want to say that i've seen mainly uh failures in that working model like <laughs> I, I, not like you know not not as in like oh this is disastrous and like you know the whole company failed because of that but you can definitely even even today i still see in pockets of uh examples that i think um uh, made that working model not working right so so let me kind of be explicit so the 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 way that i've seen on both sides of the aisle is uh folks on the application side Right, they they complain about problems, right? That like, okay, this is not working. It's not able to, you know, allow me to do X, Y, and Z, right? And they kind of then threw that problem over the wall to the platform team, and the platform team like catch it. They either uh, are just doing exactly what the the applications team tell them to do, right? For example, I need you to build it in this way. So that I can like I can use it, right? Like so, they either are taking orders from the application team uh, and not thinking about is that the right architecture? Is this only solving your problem? Are there things down the road that this makes this not like a long term solution, right? Uh, they, they either do that or they're like, who are you to talk to me? I'm gonna take orders from you, right? Like I'm gonna just do my thing because that's what I care about the most, right? So. And so, so, so I've seen those two extreme examples play out in reality. Even, and then, even the ahead. way you're describing it sounds like a delicate balance. Like you want some pushback, but not, uh, you know, neither of these extremes. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so the the part that I always uh, I, I like I'm gonna quote on on uh, one of the sort of legendary engineering leader at LinkedIn that he he used to say like. Do you want to be part of the problem or do you want to be part of the solution, right? And and the thing is that a lot of times the application team think that you know it's it's the it's the platform's job to build the solution and it's the platform's job to 
make them successful in using those tools and, and the capabilities. And, and the thing is that it has to be very much hand in hand. Um, so, so let me kind of break it down, right? Like, you know, you think about there's various different stages as you are building a, pro building a platform. And in, the, in day one, like as, as you're building that capability, is to have accountability on both sides, right? I would always go to my team and say, hey, you know what? It's not just the platform's job to deliver the feature you need. If the feature is end up delivered and you're like, you know what? That's not the right feature that's gonna solve my problem because I have all, all the other problems. I'm not gonna be able to use that platform. I said, hey, you know what? It's as much of your responsibility as, as much as their responsibility as it is yours, right? So I'm gonna hold both of you accountable to make this successful. So, so I think from day one, that just really forces the teams to, to think about it together as they have the same goal, the same success, right? Like that, that both sides have. And then, so, so uh, once this um, uh, sort of maybe the, a, a, a MVP is built, and you get into this sort of adoption phase, right? This is, you know, a lot of times the platform team has these challenges. Uh, they build something, they think it's amazing, the world's wonderful, like the most the most wonderful thing in the world. And then like the, the, the folks are like, you know, I've got something here that kind of worked for me. Why would I want it to like migrate all my approach to yours? Right? I have to, like people just have that in, in, intrinsically uh, unwillingness to to go move into something new even though that's a new thing long term may be beneficial for them so the way that i also see that's worked really well is uh having this model that i like to call champion model uh so so let's say for example you build a platform and you have to convince 10 other teams to use it right mm -hmm. don't say hey like oh, all of you guys come and use my thing but start with a couple of them who are already leaning in, right? They are like already showed, they already showed interest. They already are like, you know what? Like I'm actually excited about this thing. So get them on board first, mm -hmm. right? Because they are the customers who are more likely to be telling you what's going wrong and they are not gonna abandon you, right? Before like, you know, just because there is a simple bug that you have in your system. Like, so work with them to address really their need and also allows your platform resources to be able to focus on making them happy right so once you have solved make once you have get team a fully onboarded and happy using your platform you go to b team b you go to team c and once you have like like i don't know four out of the 10 teams onboarded and they started to demonstrate the value of using your platform boom you know what the rest of the six teams will just fall in line um so i think again the, in the adoption phase, there is also that sort of approach and that needs to be think very carefully as well. And I would say then the last phase, you know, we talk about during the building phase, during the adoption phase, and then in the mature phase, right? So let's say you've already got a platform that is running, everybody's using it. And obviously we all know that you have to continuously evolving and building on top of it, right? Like, and, and then like just, just creating that holistic culture um, that like the 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 application team, they should be like demand. They should demand the platform teams, not as in like. And again, another uh, mistake that I've seen uh, people make is like, oh, you know, the platform is not able to solve my problem, so I'm gonna go build myself something else. <laughs> <laughs> and I think engineers, this is this is engineers like like you know, uh, it's not the greatest unless it's built by me, right? Like I think this is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> in general, what we all have is like, you know, mine is the greatest. Uh, so, so, so creating that culture on the application side to really demand um, the platform uh, to, to be able to solve the problems with them. Uh, so I think that's one. And also on the application side is, is having this model, what we call like SME, right? Like the subject matter experts. Uh, so thinking about, you know, the individuals who are expert at using those platforms and they become sort of this local champion uh, for platforms in their team, right? So imagine that you build a, a platform that uh, in a team of 20 people, if you have one person who is an expert of using it, then the, uh, the other team, the other individuals on your team can go to that person to learn how to use it. At the same time, if they have an official request, it's actually much easier to go through that person, the SME, 
because the SME understands the platform capability. So they're not just going to ask any random feature, right? They're going to ask feature that really matters uh, mm -hmm. to the team, right? So, so that like, you know, they also, the platform is also much easier for them to take those feature asks and, and then work with the SME to figure out what's the right solution um, to evolve the platform. So, so I think, you know, I, I say it a lot, but I, I, I do think it's, it's, it really takes both uh, sides of the coin to make this happen really well. And, and then one last thing I would say is also just from architecture standpoint, like from platform architecture standpoint, always think about how to build a platform in an extensive way, in extensible way, right? Mm -hmm. You don't, you, you want it to democratize as much as you can. Like, you know, if you have a platform, a team of 10 that's building this tool, like you have 500 people who are using it. And think about how you can, give them those 500 people a chance to contribute to your platform. The more that you can design your architecture in that way, the better it gets. What, what are some ways that the platforms at LinkedIn support this? Oh, we, we actually, uh, I want to say uh, many of our platforms do that. Like uh, I know that you are quite familiar with our ProML uh, and like the, the uh, uh, platform and you can actually uh, build your modules on top of it. You can uh, uh, like like a simple example is uh, my team actually um, uh, developed this uh, model like explainability um, capability and then so they they used it in their application that went really well and they just kind of built it as an extensive module on the platform so other people who wanted to use it they can use it too. Right. Mm -hmm. Another example is our, uh, you know, we have a platform for anomaly detection uh, and forecasting. So, so you think about there, there can be use cases where the existing algorithms that we build into the platforms were not enough to de detect a particular um, anomaly. So, so we actually again allow the the application teams to then introduce their own algorithms on top of it. Right. So you, there's there's always that. You know, the platform is focused on the core, but if the platform is architected in a way that allows that extensibility, uh, then you got all the 500 other people who is going to be working for free for you to make the platform better, right? Versus yeah. they decided, you know what, the platform is not able to solve my problem. Let me build my own. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to take a second to remind folks, if you're watching via the Home tab uh, on the conference platform, Make sure you click into the streams tab so you have access to the chat. And I welcome you to ask any questions in the chat and I'll work them into the conversation. Uh, before jumping into questions and continuing the interview, I just wanted to observe that a lot of what you described about the relationship between the platform team and the application team uh, would equally apply between your team and the business team that you serve, but just from the other direction. Uh, do you apply the same kind of philosophy in that relationship? Uh, yeah, that's a really good uh, uh, meta observation. Uh, absolutely. I, I think the the part that I've always seen of organizations, how to help organization to be successful is, is again, for them to feel like they are really not working against each other. They are working towards the same goal, right? Once the folks really internalize, our goal is the same, is to make this successful. Then like everything just fall together. Um, so, so I agree. I think that's a really good observation. Uh, interesting question on this topic from Thomas in the uh, in Q&A about avoiding quote unquote hero syndrome. You, you talked about kind of engineers always wanting to build it themselves. Uh, that's maybe related to this idea of hero sy syndrome, but the team that kind of wants to be the team to, to build the platform. And uh, LinkedIn's maybe a little bit beyond this because you've got established teams that own platform, but have you seen early on where, you know, there are a new technology or idea comes around and different teams are kind of vying to be the one who builds and owns the official thing? Um. I would say that I, first of all, I, I think it's uh, uh, was it Tom who was uh, Thomas? Ma ma yeah, Thomas made that comment. I I I I feel very strongly agree with you that like you're avoiding the hero syndrome. And I there was once I heard somebody saying that you know in terms of which kind of talent they like they hire when they interview, what matters the most to them. Uh, uh, that was like a startup founder, and his comment is like I'm looking for somebody who has a 
high IQ over ego ratio. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the the fact that like you know, I, and I think sometimes ego can really get in the way of uh, of the broader picture. Um, so Evan Ding, you know, maybe in the really early days when uh, LinkedIn was kind of going through a uh, growth pain, when we had multiple teams, multiple data teams. Um, uh, in various different parts of the company, right? Like, uh, I, I was literally like, so, so uh, I, I'm gonna take just one sentence to describe LinkedIn a little bit. So, so organizationally, LinkedIn is functionally organized, right? So we have engineering team that reports to head of engineering. We have product reporting to head of product. We have like, you know, the finance team report to our and your CFO, and like, and then all of them then report up to the CEO. And back then, when I remember that when I first joined. Uh, LinkedIn uh, eight years ago, we literally had a data team in uh, engineering, which I am in part. Uh, like, and then we also have a data team that is reporting to product. We also have a, a data team that reports into our CFO. So, so, so you can kind of see that. Sure, I think in the early days, uh, it took a lot more effort to align, making sure that you know we avoid that hero syndrome and then actually all come together and building the right things all together. But I think nowadays it's it's uh, it's uh, it's simpler, it's easier just because also the company is getting a lot more mature uh, and, and from organizational uh, standpoint as well. Mm -hmm. uh, l let's talk about some of the specific areas that your team uh, operates and, and kind of has built out capability. One of those is experimentation. Can you talk a little bit about uh, experimentation, why it's so important at LinkedIn and some of the things that you've done there? Absolutely. So uh, experimentation, I, I know sometimes that term gets used in various different ways, you, you know, but I think that here you're particularly referring to sort of this co randomized control experiment, like A-B testing, uh, that, that's also kind of another common term that people use. Uh, so uh, why why is it important? Um, and I, I'm I'm actually uh, gonna gonna first use a uh, a, a story and to 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 like, especially I know a lot of folks in the audience are MA, ML engineers. You you develop a lot of models. Um, and I, when I first joined LinkedIn almost eight years ago, and, and like a couple months after I joined the company, um, there was this, I was pulled in into this discussion. Um, and, and at the time, LinkedIn, just a little backdrop, uh, like we, we didn't really have an experimentation platform, like, you know, running experiment was a little bit of spotty, like depending on like who you are, like, you know, whether you wanted to do it or not, like then you kind of, you know, so so it wasn't, it wasn't like common practice in terms of our product development at all at the time. And so I was put into this discussion. Uh, uh, the, 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 um, the discussion was that there was a experiment that was run on uh, launching a new um, machine learning model eight years ago, like LinkedIn wasn't that sophisticated when it comes to machine using machine learning in product development yet. So, so think about you know the bar was low, and then you got that model that that was a launch that was like amazing, right? Like you know you you looking at the the numbers coming from experiments, it was just like shockingly amazingly good <laughs> result. Mm -hmm. And so so the team went ahead and launched it. And so I, uh, you know, back then LinkedIn was still a uh, independent, well, it's still a um, standalone company. We were not part of Microsoft. So, so all these, uh, you know, people watching those very closely because that, if you have a, a ten percent lift on revenue, that's huge in terms of uh, um, what translates into our financial numbers, and then that goes into our stock price and all of that, right? And so, so our finance team came and then they looked me at that like, wait, wait a minute. You launch this thing, but I'm I'm watching the numbers in terms of our revenue, but I did not see a tick. I did not see <laughs> I in my time series like I did not see that there is a gain in our numbers. Like, like that's not real. <laughs> that's not real. <laughs> so, so what we had to do was we actually had to ramp down that that experiment literally like you think about like you know you got this wonderful feature we have to ramp it down reverse it to to actually then we saw in that time boom you can you can have a drop right to to actually make everybody believe this is actually a great thing that we are launching that we're building so 
I, you know, so now think about fast forward <laughs> to today. Uh, I mean, Ding Ding, we, we at every single given time, we have about 500 experiments that's running. Um, and that ranges not just from uh, our algorithm and uh, improvements, but also is pretty much every single product launch, every single change that we're making, we actually have it go through A-B test because that's the way that we understand how, how our members, how our users are actually reacting uh, to the changes we're making. Do they like it? Do they not like it? Right. And for every single launch, we monitor like like effectively like over a thousand um, metrics just so that we, we get a sense uh, as much as we could of how this is this a good feature or is this a bad feature. But not only that, internally, as in our process, it's like our we are using those every team are taking the results from their experiments and as the are counting of how, how much they have contributed. Right. Like so so it 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 really, you know, think about that like you know, going from eight years ago where we are, we were where we were uh, well, for that one launch to today, it's it's a drastic uh, uh, it's a drastic improvement. Um but but like the benefit to the company is is tremendous, right? Because uh, think about over the time, over the years, why did we decide to invest more in ML? Right, it's because we realized. Wait, wait a minute. Like you know, the the it, it was a really good investment when we when we actually are focusing, um, um, uh, you know, developing those algorithms that is actually able to bring a lot of upside to the business. So so that uh, you know translates into the right investment to the company for the company, mm -hmm. and at the same time, like you know, there is also this culture that uh again going back to thomas's question on this heroism right i think it's maybe i was a, a bit too harsh on ourselves like i think uh heroism is is everywhere like you know we would have this uh maybe two product managers who are both thinking my idea of building this product is is better right like so so they like nowadays instead of arguing with each other intuition against intuition like you know what the conversation become very simple right why don't I just test it, <laughs> right? If I test it and it tells me that it's it's a better thing, and or maybe it tells me that my intuition is wrong, I will learn something, right? So it kind of really intrinsically changed this culture of maybe this heroism culture to this learning culture, um, to this really data uh, informed culture. So. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, that was a long answer to your question. Yeah, you mentioned something in there that was really interesting uh, that you measure uh, the contribution of folks on your team based on their results from this experimentation platform. And if I'm understanding you correctly, it makes a ton of sense. If you, you don't want to measure folks just based on kind of model results in a vacuum because, you know, who knows what those actually uh, result in in production. But then in production, you know, all if, if a model's in production for you know a long period of time, you've got all other kind of models and things happening on the site that are impacting the long-term impact. And so uh, tying their performance to the results in the experimentation platform is an interesting way to kind of isolate the the impact of that one model. Is that the idea? Yeah, so so first of all, maybe just make a small correction. I, I really I don't mean as in, hey, when we are evaluating a, a, a engineer like you know okay. a, how, how much like metrics did you gain like uh in in that in that sense like i mean that uh, i i think a lot of time is thinking about in terms of the team in terms of the area like we we have a goal we have a target and that target let's say is to improve metrics x by five percent mm -hmm. and and then like whether this whole team when i say team i actually more like area we talk about how linkedin is cross-functionally um, collaborating together to mm -hmm. achieve that 5%. But did this area, did this line of business achieve that 5% um, uh, gain uh, on that metric? Like, you know, we we do keep, keep a very close eye on, like, you know, do, and then that is is measured against the experiments, right? Like, you know, we add up all the, 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 the gains that we have from various different experiments that we have to see, uh, do we hit that goal? Um, but mm -hmm. in terms of obviously, in terms of individual, yeah, the, 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 the that's, that's, there's a lot more that goes there's into There's a ton of issues there. The point was more that the experiment is an interesting way to isolate the the real life impact of a model in a way that it's hard to do, you know, without 
exposing it to the real world. And when once it's exposed to the real world for a long period of time, there are other factors that make it hard to isolate that particular model's impact. Definitely, definitely. And and I always think about when we're building models, you know, we obviously we have our utility function objective, and then you you train your model, you really try to optimize that. And we do our offline replay also to see, hey, you know, is this model actually we think that it's gonna improve CTR? Is it actually gonna be improving CTR? But all these are just I like to think about this as in in like, you know, my 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 boss used to say like intent versus impact, right? So mm -hmm. so you your intent when you're building the model is to optimize you know, you know, towards that objective function, right? But did they really, right? That's where experimentation comes in because that is actually measuring the real impact of what your algorithm is doing. Mm -hmm. uh, another area that LinkedIn has invested quite a bit in is uh, privacy, in particular differential privacy. Um, can you maybe give us a, an overview of your team's work in that area? Uh, certainly, I, I think I think it should not be a surprise to everyone here that privacy is very, very important, and it, and it, I, I believe it's actually one of the the biggest disruption that we will have. Um, what disruption always presents challenges and opportunity at the same time. But like, it, you know, thinking about uh, from uh, you know the the regulation standpoint, which is you know the bare minimum that we we hopefully uh, uh, forces. Many of us to start thinking about this area more seriously, like GDPR, CCPA, even thinking about you know Apple's uh, uh, IDFA, right? Like you know all all this. Um, uh, this is sort of where it, it's not about if anymore, right? It's it's about really when. <laughs> so so uh, it's, and obviously from from consumer standpoint, it's it's a super super important area as well. And 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 for those of you who are you know intrinsically very driven by uh, solving really challenging problems technology wise and, like this is really also just the area that has tons of opportunities um so so going back to your your question with regarding you know my team's work on differential privacy uh, I want to first like maybe motivate a little bit because when we talk about uh, uh, privacy or data privacy uh, it's it's a it's a massive area right like and uh, you know you think about the uh, this is always it's interesting of a of, of a, a tussle between you know even just the, the the term data and privacy right data think about what data does we use data we 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 extract information from data that's what like that's what data is for to data scientists and to 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 ML folks um and then you got privacy privacy is really about how to uh, prevent sharing information right like so you got both you wanted to extract information you you got the other pool that you wanted to actually um uh, uh, uh sort of uh, uh uh stop sharing information so it's it's kind of that that interesting uh tussle between the two and and you know we 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 talk about like you can you can introduce privacy by um to some extent right think about a lot of what gdpr is doing say hey you know this pi information like like we should anonymize it Right. And and then you got a lot of this algorithm that's there as well. Right. Like K anonymity, like, you know, all this that is able to do certain level or different levels of anonymization. But that's not enough. Right. Because if you think about uh, there's I remember stats uh, from uh, research several years ago that among a U.S. population, uh, like 87 percent of U.S. population, if you know their um, uh, birthday, zip code, um, and I think the other one is like a, a gender. Um, I, I think it's yeah, birthday, gender, and zip code. Then you will be able to know who they are. Like you're gonna pin down who they are. So so that just says how challenging it is uh, to to do privacy well. So coming back to like differential privacy, yeah, it it's really uh, has become. Um, and more of a gold standard for how we preserve uh, uh, privacy in, in data. Um, the concept of differential privacy is very simple, right? So what, what it really says at a high level, right, is um, uh, what you can learn from the data should be the same with or without a single person's information as part of it, right? So, so think about if you are learning a distribution um, from a huge data set, right? 
And let's say you, you learned about a distribution, it's a, it's a, it's a curve, right? And then mm -hmm. you take one member or one user's information out of that data set. And then you learn that you use the same algorithm, you learned the, 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 the another curve. These two curves should be very, very close to each other, right? So this is where what we call like should be the difference should be epsilon, right? It should be, should be <laughs> very small. I, I had to throw the epsilon number there. So, so that's what, um, and, and then so, so if you can, that's differential privacy guarantee. So if you have an algorithm that is able to meet that criteria, you know, it's guaranteed to have differential privacy. And it's, you know, then I'm not going to go into a lot of theoretical details, but then it comes with a lot of benefits. You can do the, do the additive and all of this, right? So, so we have uh, very heavily invested into um, and, you know, in both, uh, I mean, I, I ultimately, like, you know, we wanted to apply differential privacy in um, the, the way that we use data across the board. We, uh, we actually have uh, introduced it in our uh, ads reporting. And think about like you know the reports that we give to our advertisers uh, that that we 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 apply differential privacy on top of it. Um, when we share our data um, externally uh, to public, um, and like for example, what are the who, what are the companies that are hiring? Like what are the skills that's trending? Like all this, we actually also apply differential privacy before we share the data externally, just so that we we can really. Um, make sure that we put our members and customer first um, and, and then so that there's no chance and that their information will be um, would be leaked or would be uh, uh, you know under under this sort of you know there's a bunch of attacks that people can do to to back back engineer the individual information and, and the under differential privacy this just guarantees that there's no such a way that there's no such risk mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so it, do you do you think that differential privacy is um, kind of ready for prime time for the I don't know average company? I mean, it, LinkedIn has been at the the front of this and has spent a lot of time working on it. Uh, how ready do you think it is for kind of general consumption? And, and in particular, you know, there's differential privacy and differentially private machine learning, which is a whole other set of challenges. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, uh, I, I want to say, you, you know, there. Are, I, I want to say it is ready. Uh, I'm gonna be bold on that one, right? Like, uh, so, so first of all, um, we all know Census actually. Like, Census is using differential privacy mm -hmm. uh, now. So, so if Census is using it, I, I think you know <laughs> everyone else should be using it. <laughs> uh, and and on top of it, I do also think that there are uh, uh, a lot of open sourced. Um, uh, capabilities that's out there already. Um, that uh, like Microsoft has this um, um, uh, big open source differential privacy solutions out there. I think Google also has some. Um, so so even if you don't have do, like expertise in your own company and uh, to develop your own algorithm, uh, you can still get started by using the ones that's that's already open sourced, right? So I do think that. Every, I would encourage everyone to to start um, getting into this field. And on the other hand, like you know, are there challenges of um, uh, you know building those solutions and applying those solutions? Yeah, absolutely. Like I have to say, like uh, one one challenge that uh, we we see very practical challenge um, is how do you think about uh, you know we talk about this difference between the two curves you learn the epsilon like how do you choose it right how do you choose epsilon because that is going to indicate the trade-off between the utility and the privacy right that you like who who's going to decide on choose like what's the right epsilon for your company for your application right so that's a very practical uh challenge that the company has to face the second one is also uh the a lot of when, when people think about differential privacy they think about okay you got data you add a bunch of noise to it Mm -hmm. And then you can, you know, forget about the rest, right? Like everybody knows how to add noise, like you know, it's to to data. <laughs> it's, uh, That's the easy part. It's the easy part. It's the easy part. You can choose a lot plus noise. You can choose Gaussian noise. You can just like you know all this, but but the hard part is actually um, depends on the depends on the application, depends on the query. Like different differential privacy algorithms, even though that they could all meet the differential privacy criteria. So they are all differentially private uh, algorithms, but they can actually uh, have a different information loss in the process. 
right? So, so let's say, for example, you have a you have a query. If you apply the noise um, uh, at the very uh, initial step, top of the funnel, right? So you what what when you go through this whole uh, query, what you get is, is there's very little information. So if if I if if you turn a data into white noise, then there's no point of having that data to begin with, right? So, so, so the the challenge of differential privacy is also there needs that sort of this uh, expertise when when in especially in some applications to come up with the right algorithms that you can actually uh, preserve privacy, but also preserve the utility of the data itself as well. Yeah, for for more on this, I'd refer folks to the interview that I did. Um, the interview was just over a year ago at NeurIPS in Vancouver with Ryan Rogers at LinkedIn on the way that uh, differential privacy was applied to this problem uh, that you call the top K problem. Yeah. Um, uh, and we go into a ton of, of detail there. Uh, in our last few minutes, I'd love to hear about the some of the tools that and, and platforms that kind of give your team leverage at LinkedIn. Uh, well, I'm, I, I hope I made it uh, uh, bluntly obvious that I'm a big fan of platforms <laughs> in general. <laughs> And so, uh, you know, we we uh, we have a uh, actually a sister team uh, that to me uh, that they they really focus on building a lot of the data platforms. Um, and for again, not just my team, right? Like thinking about like uh, the, the the rest of the company uh, as well. So I would say a few of them that uh, has been super critical. Um, one uh, I've already mentioned about experimentation platform, right? Because that's really the more the easier that you make uh, experimentation process to be, uh, the more people is going to be using it, and then the more data driven that the company will be, and then that would have a cascading impact in in how we are investing as a company, and the kind of people that you attract, and all of that. Right. So I think experimentation platform, um, and the second of all uh, is certainly our machine learning platform. Uh, uh, that uh, you know, a platform that is able to both thinking about how uh, to uh, you know, if I think about any field, uh, is it how fast different fields has evolved over the past few years. Like machine learning area is is definitely that's like like literally you you got every time every day you open up you know a, a research journal you you will see something new that some people has developed that mm -hmm. works better than what happened you know yesterday. So. So, uh, so thinking about the platform is building a way that is able to be extensible, um, that is able to evolve with the industry, with the field. Um, so, so super critical that as well. And like, and again, also, uh, you know, how how do you seamlessly transition between online and offline? So a lot of really uh, uh, good problems in that space, and certainly my team uses that uh, as well. And uh, the other. Uh, uh, platform, I would say, is our uh, I, like a platform that uh, devoted to metadata and search and discovery, right? So thinking about you have uh, a lot of various different data constructs or data assets, right? And like when I it's like a metric is a data construct, a model is a data construct, um, just any data set is a data construct, a feature that goes into the model is a data construct. And when you start to be really very data focused as a company mm -hmm. and you got all these data constructs and data assets that lies around and how can you make sure that uh, they can be leveraged by many people? How can you make sure that, you know, if there are uh, issues on them that we actually have a way to identify them? Like, so, so having this almost like a catalog of all these data assets uh, in the core of many other applications is really, really important um, as well. Do you know what you're referring to? Uh, it's Data Hub. We call it Data Hub. Data Hub? Okay. Yeah. And then, uh, so, so like, you know, you can also think about, like, how does the, all these data constructs relate to each other, right? Mm -hmm. One big challenge that I'm sure for a lot of the data developers here is, like, you know, you got, you got a data, maybe that fits into your model or fits into some other uh, uh, you know, things that you're doing. You have no idea where the data come from, right? And then over time, this data may deteriorate, this data may change because of five steps ahead, like, you know, like in the chain, in the lineage that it's, it's, it's creating that problem. So having, again, like a 
a, a tool, a platform that is able to provide in that lineage, um, j j just really, uh, I, I cannot say, uh, I cannot understate how important that is. And then we also have a platform that is able to help us uh, uh, do uh, anomaly detection, forecasting, and root cause analysis as well, right? When something goes wrong with the data, like what caused it? And then why, I mean, first of all, to be able to detect it, we, we know, for example, like models, in like features can have a distribution shift for many reasons. I could have a bug in my product, all of a sudden the telemetry, the tracking is off and that fades into my model automatically. And then the model turned out to be not performing anywhere, anymore. Like, like being able to monitor at every step of the funnel um, uh, is also obviously very important to model development, to, to you know, matrix development, all of that as well. And and then so so since you mentioned Pino, I'm also gonna uh, you know uh, I I'll touch on that one as well. Um, so uh, Pino is our sort of a distributed OLAP storage um, that uh, we have developed ourselves, and Ding um, open sourced uh, several years ago. Um, that is really able to provide scale. Of I mean, think about the scale of data that we operate at LinkedIn. Like that is able to allow us to be able to both serve online use cases. Uh, for example, if you uh, go to LinkedIn uh, on the site, a lot of the an analytics that's on the page are powered by by Pino in the back end, and it allows us to do uh, internally um, and uh, able to do uh, our OLAP uh, on on it as well. So super powerful. And we talk about differential privacy. We we also are able to build a meteor on top of Pino so that we can have all the use cases that's already in Pino that then be able to easily onboard into the differential privacy uh, capability as well. Awesome, awesome. Well, we've covered a ton of ground in this conversation, uh, but it's time to wrap up. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us this morning uh, and sharing a bit about what you and your team are up to at LinkedIn. Thank you so much for having me and I really enjoyed that conversation. Same here, thanks, yeah.